Hey everybody. Um, I'm Gilbert Sanchez. I am a senior systems engineer at Facebook. Um, I've been there seven years, and here you can find a couple of interesting repos. Um, on my GitHub, you'll find a lot of really bad political references, and on my Twitter, you'll find a lot of bad code. Um, specifically, the things that you actually probably do want to check out are the Chef cookbooks and the ITCPE cookbooks. Um, if you Google my name, I am not the Filipino man who lived in a tree uh, or a coconut tree. Um, that sounds pretty awesome, but uh, I think I'm going to have to save that for retirement. Um, I'll be referencing these uh, cookbooks a little bit on later in the slides. So what is it that I do at Facebook? I manage the corporate Windows fleet, which is essentially ensuring that all our servers are running our base applications, um, running Chef correctly, uh, making sure that kind of everything's happy. Uh, I build all the Packer images and work on patching, and as well as working with the client platform engineering team. So those are the guys who build all the laptops and kind of do all that stuff. So before I dig into uh, kind of the story, I want to talk about a few Facebookisms. So the first thing I want to talk about are API cookbooks. Uh, Phil Dubowitz has a great talk on YouTube um, talking about this, but for those who don't know API cookbooks, essentially they're chef cookbooks that are driven by attributes. So you set some sane default um, preferences in your default attributes, and then you allow recipes to overwrite those attributes so you can make changes uh, later on down the line. Um, the next thing is in initialization cookbooks, which is essentially the way we load all our API cookbooks, and then make any customizations that we want to. So the two repos I've mentioned, uh, FB init and CP init, uh, will contain that, and you'll see how we do that in production and for our laptops. Um, and last but not least, I want to uh, mention sharding. So sharding is a way for us to take the whole set of the fleet and essentially put it into uh, buckets, so like percent buckets. And that will allow you to roll out changes slowly over time. So where did it all go around? We have the classic recipe for disaster. It was Friday night, uh, happy hour, maybe had a couple of drinks. It was a small change, I had some code accepted. Um, started looking at all my task work and I thought to myself, you know what, this is accepted, I'm ready to go. Let's, it's a small change, whatever, just, let's just land it. Um, huge mistake, right? Um, went back to looking at my tasks and then I got this message. Hey, we're seeing a bunch of servers rebooting. Did you change anything? And that's when I got the giant knot in the pit of my stomach. And I immediately stood up, looked around, and I thought to myself, Where, where's everybody? Oh, it's Friday. And I yelled out, fudge, except I didn't say fudge. Um, and I was pretty certain that would be the last day of working at Facebook. Uh, oh, sorry, Gilbert. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I got on the phone, started making calls, trying to kind of undo my mistake. Um, but I wanted to know, like, what, what did I change that actually caused this? Like, this was just a simple cookbook rearrange, right? So how many, are, how many of you are, you are familiar with the reboot resource? Hands? Yeah, it's pretty handy when you use it correctly. It's pretty devastating when you don't. Um, so what I had done was I actually moved the code that was including the cookbook B recipe up outside of some additional conditional logic. And what I had failed to realize is that in cookbook A that I wasn't actually touching, uh, there was a reboot uh, resource that was called. So, so I came in the next day and I found that there wasn't a box ready for me to pack my stuff. So I thought to myself, okay, well I'm not gonna get fired. How do I avoid this from ever happening again? So phase one. Phase one is planning, right? So the first part of planning is starting to understand what is the current state of affair of our fleet and our um, kind of operational you know, goals, right? Um, so what we found is we had a lot of manual boring work. The ownership of patching was pretty nebulous. Um, there was, we had a vulnerability management team. We had my team that would manage kind of the base OS. Uh, but then we also had the owners, like who was responsible for patching? If I install a patch and reboot your machine, you might not want that, right? So, who, who owns patching, right? Do, 
do I own patching? Do the end users own patching? Do they care about patching? Should they care about patching, right? Is that something that you want your end users to have to think about? Um, so, and we also had a lot of hesitation around deploying software, WMFI, for example, where we were worried about restarting the whole fleet. Um, the next thing we did was we tried to gather our requirements. So DBAs have their own way of doing things. They don't want us to reboot their machines randomly. Um, they want to slowly you know, shut down, gracefully shut down things. Um, so we wanted to offer the opt-out option. Now the nice thing about the opt-out option when you're codifying it is that now you have somebody who's on the hook. Joe, who committed that line that says, I'm opting out, actually is on the hook for getting his machines patched. Um, the other thing we wanted to ensure is that we had high availability, right? We don't want to shut down all the web servers at once. That'd be pretty bad. Everybody would be upset. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the code that we wrote would kind of keep that in mind. Um, we also had teams that worked in multi-region. So we have teams that are based out of Menlo Park, but they handle services out in EMEA and APAC, and we needed to consider those things when we were uh, making these changes. So phase two, uh, execution. So now that we know what we need, we have our, um, our requirements, let's start looking at Chef. Now, how many of you don't use Chef? Cool, so there's a good number of hands. The good thing is this is actually not necessarily Chef specific. This uh, particular attributes uh, image is very Chef specific, and it's a little bit scary just because you, you realize that there's actually 15 steps to how attributes are calculated. But the cool thing is that the way that Facebook API cookbooks work is we only ever look at steps one and two. So now that we're reading our attributes from our default attributes and then we're essentially allowing overwriting with our recipes, now we can start dropping scripts, dropping any binaries, um, any tools that you guys might use. Maybe you have a piece of code that calls out to a Slack channel or something like that. And last but not least, we set up a scheduler. Who's calculated time in code? All right, who's actually enjoyed calculating time in code? Yeah, no one. Uh, <laughs> it's really, really painful. Um, so how do you offer a service that, you, that is available for folks in Menlo Park to shut down services in Australia, right? Do they understand that the time zone differences, um, are they gonna be able to figure that out correctly? And let's say you wanna shut down an entire region. Uh, an entire region consists of multiple time zones. So one thing we did was we offered a UTC solution and we allowed folks to create a region based off of multiple time zones and use a single UTC time to make those changes. Um, I will warn you, UTC to local time is really painful. Um, it is very common to go say, I wanna restart at Wednesday, but actually that's Thursday for Australia and now you have to take all those things into account, right? You have a lot of um, shifting times. So how do we know that machines need a reboot? Um, Chef actually offers something really cool called uh, reboot pending, which is a function uh, for the node. And underneath the hood, what it's actually doing is it's looking for a couple of registry settings. Um, funny enough, it actually also works for Ubuntu. Um, so now we can look at the machine and understand if the machine needs a reboot. So let's look at some code. So here we have our default attributes, um, and I say your cookbook because I want you guys to be able to walk away and actually put something together. Um, we're hoping on open sourcing ours, uh, but we're still working through that process, but hopefully you guys will see that soon. Um, so the first thing I wanna call out is that first line, default your cookbook equals bracket, right? Um, we have this saying at Facebook, own your namespace. When you do that, you essentially ensure that nobody accidentally comes by and by let's say they add to their attributes file instead of their recipe file, they could accidentally stomp on all of your work. So that's one way to avoid that. So here in our example, we have um, opt-out as the first option, right? If you don't want us to patch your machine or reboot your machine, you can just completely opt out and you're on the hook. Um, the next thing is auto-rebooting. Do you want us to actually auto-reboot? Maybe you want to opt into the maintenance window, but you don't want us to reboot. And the next four settings are all time settings, right? Here we're saying from Saturday, Starting at 1 a.m. for the duration of five hours, so 1 a.m. to 6 a.m., we want to have our window of maintenance happen. So here's how somebody would customize their cookbook. In their own cookbook recipe, they would actually go in and add, so the top one is an example of a team that decided to completely opt out. It's totally fine, you can do that. Uh, on the bottom, we have a team that decided to reboot their machines at noon for one hour. 
I would never reboot my machine at noon out for one hour. Like, that's not something I would do. But guess what? I'm not there. I don't own their service, right? I don't necessarily know when the best time for them to do that is. So they can actually go and submit this and actually choose for themselves. So now we can actually start calculating time. So here we extend the node class, and we create a function called maintenance mode. And I didn't include all the time math because it's pretty boring, but I'm sure that most of you can kind of calculate this yourself. But essentially, what we want to return is a Boolean for result. We want to know, are you in your window or not? The other nice thing you can do is you can actually do some additional logic here and say, hey, is this the first time you've, you're booting up? Like, maybe the first time you boot up, you actually want to say maintenance mode is true. Um, so that's something that we can kind of work on. So what does that put, where does that put this? Now we have default, default API settings, we have user customizations, and we have a node function that we can leverage to check on those. And now we have a chocolatey talk. Um, here we're able to leverage the new function, and we're actually able to check to see if that node is in the maintenance window. And so here we would install, we would upgrade PowerShell only if you're in that window. Now, let's say you have a team that deploys a web service, and they like to do that on Saturdays, but they don't really want to stick around, and they've already rolled out to UAT, and they know that they want to upgrade on Saturdays. They can define their window, and they can say, you know what, only upgrade this application if you're in the window. And kind of the catalyst, right? What did, the thing that actually brought me here. Um, so we created a smarter reboot, and essentially what we do is we take advantage of four conditionals. The first being opt out, right? If you've opted out, we're not gonna reboot you. Uh, the next three things that we look at are whether you're in your maintenance window, whether your machine actually needs a reboot, because there's no need for us to reboot your machine if you don't actually need it, and then we check to see if you have the auto reboot option, right? Maybe you do want to opt into the maintenance window, but you don't actually want us to reboot your server. So phase three, profit, just kidding. Uh, it's more work. And my 11-year-old thought that was a hilarious line, uh, but little does he know that there's always more work. Um, so you're ready to roll, you've written your code. Um, now you have to start rolling stuff out. Um, there was definitely a few talks that I heard earlier that talked about getting that test infra. Breaking prod is significantly more expensive than breaking your test machines. So roll it out to your test boxes, right? This is a good time to convince management, hey, let me get some test VMs. If I break those and I reboot them, nobody cares. Um, have your owners start setting their attributes. Um, the time math, time math is hard, right? If they think that they're setting the right UTC time zone, but they fail to realize that that's actually one day difference, um, having them write their attributes and writing to a file actually is a great way to have them verify. And last but not least, we slow roll it. So what we did was we communicated out to the, all of IT and we said, hey, we're gonna reboot your machines on Saturdays unless you decide to either opt out or choose your own times. And for a lot of teams, they actually had very specific times that they knew this is a good time for us to patch. Um, and then for the, f for the folks who just didn't care, they said, you know what, my service is resilient enough to randomly reboot. They just, they just left it alone, and it just happened. Um, so how do you take care of catching that, those like, first hiccups, right? Because the first iteration is never gonna be perfect. Um, by slow rolling, you can leverage a cookbook in CPU tills. Uh, or sorry, the cookbook is called CPU Tills. It's in the supermarket. And you can leverage a function called shard over a week. And what that does is essentially you say, all right, by this Friday, I want to be at 100%. Starting Monday, it rolls out to the first 10%. Tuesday is 20%. Wednesday is 50. Thursday is 75. And so that way you're able to say, all right, did I break 10% of the fleet? Possibly. Uh, but it's better to catch that 10% than to wait, than to roll out to the whole fleet and break everything. Um, I want to give a couple of warnings. Chef is a config management tool. Do not leverage it as a scheduler. I see this all the time. People want Chef to be a scheduler. It isn't. Um, your OS probably has a good scheduler, right? And I say your OS because you could really do this on Windows or Linux. Um, so if you're on a Linux box, you, you have, um, oh God, it's escaping me now. Uh, so you have Windows Tasks and you have Cron. Thank you. Um, so those are great tools that you can leverage to call your, all the scripts that you dropped or any tools. Like I said before, calculating time is really difficult. It's hard for you, it's harder for your users. 
Check that file on disk, have them verify, right? Even before you even consider rolling out, have them um, go and set their settings and double check that. Um, and last but not least, I wanna give a couple of shout outs to a couple of my team members who are actually here. They're sitting over there, hey guys. Uh, who actually wrote some of the initial versions and uh, did a lot of the code review for my really, really bad code. Um, so like I said, um, what's next from us is we wanna open source. We want to, uh, we need to strip out all the Facebook stuff, all the vulgar comments that I put in, um, specifically around time math. And then uh, we wanna make sure that it's available to you guys, uh, usable day one. Um, so with that, any questions? Did I blow through that real fast? Because this thing says 27 minutes. <laughs> Brandon Presley says hello. Tell him I say hi. <laughs> in, in order to prevent cookbook sprawl, are you having the users, uh, are you doing something like a role cookbook model where they override attributes and everything? Exactly. Rather than forking and creating more cookbooks to maintain? Uh, yeah, so that's the beauty of the API cookbook, cookbook, right? So what the user can do is um, apply their recipe last and then essentially overwrite any particular setting. So one example is the CPE team does is uh, the laptop lockout timer. Let's say the default is five minutes, and that's a sane uh, setting for most people, but let's say we have a particular use case that actually merits having 10 minutes. Um, you can go in and add a single line that says timeout equals 10 minutes, and you're kind of good to go, right? Okay. Excellent. So you mentioned uh, using this for patching. Uh, I'll yeah. see, what did you use for the actual patch. <laughs> so this is the thing that I didn't want to uh, necessarily call out because um, we, we found a great, I can't remember who contributed this. Um, it was a Windows patching script. It's just like a PowerShell script. Um, that's what we ended up using. Um, there's a bunch of great tools out there and I would hate to push you in one direction or the other. Like you probably know what's best for your organization. So you know, if there are suggestions out there, I would love to hear them. All right. I just wonder if you're going to throw the name box starter or anything like that out there. Uh, for patching, no. Um, for patching, we just do like a Windows, uh, like an update script. All right. Uh, so uh, the that sharding thing looked pretty cool. Um, is there anything baked into that behavior for like it? if cookbooks start failing to stop the roll forward, or, or, or is that a manual process where you, you have to set a, you set a flag or, or just start disabling chef runs? Yeah. What, uh, what, that, what does the response look like? We, we normally have alerts, <laughs> and uh, we kind of jump in. Uh, typically, you know, we force everything to get tested prior, um, but some of those, we're always hitting edge cases since we're touching the whole fleet. Um, it's, there's always something weird that we didn't consider. Um, there is nothing specifically stopping uh, a cookbook r from rolling out, so we would have to kind of go in, set it off, and then kind of fix our errors and then go from there. Cool. Yeah. Although if you guys want to contribute to that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> I was just going to say to uh, um, to him, isn't there a, a new chef resource uh, specific for patching? I, I I believe there's something in in Chef 14 for for like um, RHSAs, but I th I thought there was something Holy more crap. generic for new security advisories if you wanted to apply patches to a machine. I thought I thought there was something baked in. Any other questions for Gilbert? Any other heckles for Gilbert? <laughs> uh, I just realized that my timer was completely off and I killed that in 20 minutes instead of 30, so thank you for listening to that speed talk. <laughs> That's all good. So if not, well, thank we'll you. thank Gilbert then. Thanks all. <laughs>